There are two sayings in surgery. One, all bleeding eventually stops. And two, there's only two types of bleeding you need to worry about, audible bleeding and your own. While that may be true, hypovolemia is the second most common cause of shock in critically ill patients. Today we're going to cover hemorrhagic shock so the bleeding you encounter in the future won't worry you. Since hemorrhagic shock is so common, we shouldn't be shocked to learn that somebody has created a classification scheme. ATLS classifies hemorrhagic shock into four categories. Each class correlates with a finite amount of blood loss and the expected physiological findings. The funny thing is that even ATLS admits that there's no real scientific validity behind their schema and the findings lack specificity. Is a patient confused because they're scared or under the influence of drugs and alcohol? Likewise, tachycardia can be caused by any number of things. In the absence of tachycardia, maybe patient medication effects. By the time you get reliable physical findings of hemorrhagic shock, the patient will already be in class three hemorrhagic shock. This represents a loss of 30 to 40% of their total blood volume, which would look something like this. As hemorrhagic shock progresses, the patient will develop several clinical findings. Tachycardia may be an early first sign, but the absence of it shouldn't be relied on. As we've mentioned in the shock lecture, a decrease in the pulse pressure is an indication of low cardiac output and will typically be seen before there's any decrease in the blood pressure. Hypotension eventually occurs, but this tends to be a later finding and really also depends on what the patient's baseline blood pressure is and their ability to compensate. The source of the bleeding will also determine whether other systemic signs of shock occur. Arterial bleeding tends to be very quick and kind of obvious, but on the other hand, venous bleeding is slower, allowing the body time to compensate and develop signs of shock, such as an elevated lactate. Your first admission hemoglobin and hematocrit are not good indicators of the amount of blood loss because these are concentration measurements and don't represent the absolute amount of blood in the system. The fallen hemoglobin concentration that you see during the initial resuscitation is a better indicator of the amount of blood loss if the resuscitation fluid that is being used is a crystalloid and it dilutes the blood volume. Given sufficient time, the body can partially compensate for hypovolemic shock. First step is to divert blood flow away from the periphery and back to the core to preserve perfusion to the vital organs. The extremities may become cool and the capillary refill prolonged. The diversion of blood flow is mediated by sympathetic nervous system, which also increases the heart rate, myocardial contractility, and the peripheral vascular resistance. The purpose is to maintain cardiac output. The reduction in renal blood flow activates the renin-angiotensin system. Angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor, augmenting blood flow to the core. This system stimulates the release of aldosterone, which forces sodium reabsorption in the distal tubules. The sodium reabsorption increases water reabsorption through solvent drag as each molecule of sodium is surrounded by a, a shell of eight water molecules. Finally, the posterior pituitary gland will release antidiuretic hormone in order to force additional water reabsorption from the distal tubules. It may be reassuring to know that all bleeding eventually stops, but unfortunately the outcomes are not as good. Given enough time, Shock can progress to the point where even with complete blood volume replacement, this would be insufficient and the patient will continue to bleed and spiral down onto death. One of the primary mechanisms for this is the lethal triad. This is a sequence of acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy that occurs if the blood loss is not rapidly controlled. We shouldn't be surprised that a patient who's in hemorrhagic shock develops an acidosis. I mean, there is an inadequate perfusion to the tissue, and as a result, lactate and anaerobic metabolism occurs. This is a cellular metabolism-driven acidosis, and so 
administering bicarbonate, it's really only just treating a number. There's no evidence that giving boluses of bicarb do anything other than to reverse the acidosis. The only solution is to treat the underlying problem. Even if you see a blood pressure response to the bicarbonate you give, you're probably only seeing the response to a fluid bolus only. In fact, you may actually be making the cellular acidosis worse, and the bicarb is quickly being converted to carbon dioxide, which is then exhaled. Now, for some goofy reason in the past, it was thought that hypothermia in hemorrhagic shock was a good thing. Hypothermia was thought to reduce cellular oxygen demand, uh, but this turned out to be true as studies demonstrated that patients who had a core temperature of 32 degrees Celsius would die and thus had a dramatic reduction in their oxygen demand. Now whether the cause of the hypothermia is environmental or iatrogenic, the risk of death is still 100%. Hypothermia occurs for several reasons. Shock causes a loss of ATP production in the cells, leading to a decrease in heat production. There's a triple whammy of hypothermia, first from the outside temperature, second the loss of body temperature blood, and finally the replacement of the body temperature blood with cold fluids. There are many ways to warm up a patient, including both passive and active means, but keep in mind that it's easier to keep a patient warm than it is to warm them up. So stop body temperature blood loss, and anything infused to the patient should be run through a warmer, especially cold transfusion. The usual treatment for accidental hypothermia is to give boluses of warmed crystalloid, but accidental hypothermia is different from traumatic hypothermia. Trauma patients don't need tons of crystalloids. The final step in the lethal triad is coagulopathy. Both acidosis and hypothermia lead to this coagulopathy by decreasing protein activity. This combines with ongoing protein loss from the bleeding followed by dilution of the remaining plasma proteins from crystalloids. Replacing lost clotting proteins requires fresh frozen plasma and fibrinogen, and there is evidence for the use of tranexamic acid in trauma patients to decrease fibrinolysis and maintain blood clots that have formed. However, there is no ev evidence for using procoagulants like factor 7a. Finally, if the patient develops a coagulopathy from medication effects such as warfarin, then you need to give specific factor replacements and platelets as appropriate if they're on a antiplatelet agent. There has been a dramatic shift in our thinking about resuscitation in hemorrhagic shock over the last 10 years. We used to focus on aggressive fluid resuscitation, but this inevitably led to a lethal triad, and it wasn't unheard of for trauma patients to get up to 30 liters of crystalloid in the trauma bay. Now, animal studies demonstrated that giving large volumes of crystalloid to trauma patients causes worsening inflammation and abdominal compartment syndrome. So now the focus is on initial damage control resuscitation, which means there's a focus on early aggressive surgery to rapidly control the bleeding. The patient has permissive hypotension to minimize the amount of crystalloids needed and also minimize blood loss from trying to drive the blood pressure up. Patients are given blood earlier in their presentation and tranexamic acid to prevent fibrinolysis. At surgery, the focus is only on controlling the source of the blood loss and not on completing a full laparotomy with anastomoses and stoma creation. Instead, the abdomen is quickly packed in all four quadrants and then out of the OR quickly before the patient becomes more acidotic, more hypothermic, and more coagulopathic. So this will mean that we will frequently see patients in the intensive care unit with open abdomens and a plan to go back to the OR for definitive therapy after we have completed the resuscitation. It should be obvious to by now that I don't think giving crystalloid to trauma patients is a good idea. Early in my training, I had a surgeon yell at me that a patient who was bleeding wasn't bleeding saline, which it turns out is a pretty good rule of thumb. I mean, bleeding patients are bleeding blood, and they often need a lot of it. Massive transfusion protocols were developed by trauma surgery and blood banks to improve the care of trauma patients. Having a clear, clear protocol in place improves blood bank logistics, since there's a clear process in place when a lot of blood is needed quickly. The trauma team is freed up to resuscitate without having to constantly call the blood bank to justify requests, while the blood bank is desperately trying to keep up with that demand. Most hospitals now have a massive transfusion pack available at all times to initiate trauma resuscitation. Each hospital and blood bank will have their own specific protocol, but the prin principles are pretty consistent. Immediately after the patient arrives, blood for coagulation factors and cross-match are sent. Then the patient is given two units of uncross-matched type O negative blood. 
If more blood is needed quickly, then another four more units of uncross-matched O negative blood can be given. If the patient can wait, then the blood bank will be able to complete the cross-match and then they can release another four units of matched blood instead of the unmatched. Most patients will not require more blood than this if you have rapid control of the bleeding. However, at this point, you need to start replacing coagulation factors. So the next step is to give one pool of platelets and six units of fresh frozen plasma. This can be then followed by another six units of cross-matched red blood cells. And then around this time, the patient's fibrinogen level will come back and you can give cryoprecipitate at the direction of the blood bank. You can then follow this with another six units of fresh frozen plasma and platelets, and then six units of red blood cells in this repeating cycle on and on as necessary. This recipe results in a patient receiving what is called a one to one to one ratio of red blood cells to plasma to platelets and mimics the composition of whole blood, which is convenient since that's what the patient's been losing. Today we covered hemorrhagic shock as an example of hypovolemic shock. We discussed the stages of bleeding as described by ATLS, but recognized the limitations in the classification. We reviewed the physiological response to bleeding, including the changes in the heart rate, pulse pressure, and vascular redistribution. We then next jumped to the consequences of ongoing blood loss and inappropriate resuscitation with the lethal triad of acidosis, hypothermia, and coagulopathy. Resuscitating a patient with hemorrhagic shock focuses now much more on initial damage control and early aggressive use of blood products, including massive transfusion protocols. In the next video, we're going to start to discuss vasopressors and inotropes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.